Well, good morning. How are you? Some of you I haven't seen in a while, like you. And, um, you know, it's been an interesting journey because I retired. <laughs> Man proposes and God disposes. What can I say? For those of you, who, this is my second retirement, by the way. Um, I retired from hospice when I was 70. That was nine years ago. Then I moved to Albuquerque for five years, and I worked with the church up there and started back into my artwork. So I've been doing my artwork. I just finished doing six weeks at Doniana Community College with a teacher by the name of Jan Archie, and Christine Campbell was in the class with me, and we were doing pottery. This isn't my first pottery class. I started taking it when I was up in Albuquerque. But I also do alcohol ink, and that's been improving, <laughs> slowly but surely. So my time has been really, really expressive and creative. And I want to thank the Browns for doing Jeremiah Was a Bullfrog. It's one of my favorite songs. In fact, last Sunday, my message on Facebook was Joy to the World. <laughs> this is a friend of mine. And I have friends who are very, very good at defining this guy's journey. But his journey is only a part of it and only for people who are at certain places in their life, don't you know? But he's been very much a part of my life for the last 35 years. People say things to me like, I don't know how you did chaplain work for 35 years. I don't know how you did it. We know there are jobs out there that other people have that I wouldn't have. You know what I mean? When it comes to emptying bedpans, not my thing. So I thought this morning, and, and I will add some more of my history over all this time for you. But basically, I wanted to talk about immortality, and I wanted to talk about it in a way that may be a different perspective for you. Because you know what, guys? We're all immortal. Is there anybody here that doesn't believe you're immortal? OK. So how do you think about that? How do you think about being immortal? What do you think about? And I'm going to ask you to participate in this. This is not a one-man stand here. You guys have to be involved. Otherwise, I might hear somebody snore. <laughs> so what does immortality mean? I mean mean to you. Does it mean peace? Can you raise your hand? Does it mean peace? Okay. Does it mean love? Yes? Okay. It means a lot of very different things, but it means part of it, what it means is being alive. So this morning, I'm talking about living the experience. A couple of weeks ago, I woke up at 1 o'clock in the morning. I do those things. And my eyes were wide open, and I went, hmm. So I went straight to my computer, turned it on, and I got downloaded about an hour and a half's worth of information. 
And it was basically living the experience, which I thought was an interesting title. It, I'm an abstract artist. It was pretty abstract. And I kept thinking to myself, hmm, well, I feel immortal. When I was a small child, I used to go out, and I have a twin brother, by the way. He and I came in through the same person and proceeded to go 180. He and I are very different people. I'd go out in the field and count the dandelions and look in, in the woods for the animals so we could talk. I never felt that I was not connected to spirit. And I say spirit now, and when I was a chaplain, I said God, because people related to God. People just related to God. That was it. Or Jehovah, or Yahweh. Whoever it was they believed in or didn't believe in, I was there as a chaplain to support them. It was my favorite ministry because no one was wrong. I wasn't telling them that they couldn't believe that way. I was giving them no negatives. I was teaching them what about them I liked and what about them they liked. What do you like about yourself? So part of that came down to when I was being a chaplain, what do we believe? What do we believe? But you know, when I'm working with people, it isn't what I believe. It's what you believe. This is a journey that's your journey. What do you believe? What do you believe if you're Buddhist? Well, basically, you believe that you die and go into the void and you recreate the cycles of life. It's called reincarnation. And if you're Jewish, and if you're traditionally Jewish, or conservatively Jewish, you believe that you are still waiting for the birth of the Savior. And some of that may have something to do, if you're in a Jewish cemetery, with some people being buried feet first. Some of the people that I met were Christian, some were Jewish, some were Buddhist, some were atheists. And in my book, as I talked to them, no one was wrong. No one. Because you are living the experience. And I cannot support you unless I understand the experience that you are living. So, if you're a Christian, there are many paths to immortality. One of them is through being saved by the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the group that comes closest to lots of ideas about death would be Islam. There are a lot of ideas about that, and because there is, when I was a chaplain, if you were Islamic, I called the Iman and asked the Iman to come and be with you. I didn't call anybody else. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, I called your pastor because that was the person who needed to show up to support you. I used to say, if you think nobody cares about you, go to the ER. The other day I saw a big commercial on a billboard. If you don't think anybody cares about you, don't pay your bill. <laughs> and I thought, well, now there we go. <laughs> if I ever think nobody cares about me, I won't pay my bills. Hmm. What an excuse. So to me, living the experience is about as you are going through your life, what is your experience? What is it that you've experienced that takes you back to you? And what is your conclusion about your life? 
oh, well, maybe we don't want to go there. Because people will tell you you're doing something wrong. I mean, I have it happen all the time. I go into a pottery class, and I'm told that's not the way to do it. That's wrong. Different teacher, different technique. For them, that's right. For the person that I studied with that I'm still doing their technique, that may not be right. And it's OK. Because the most important thing I can say to you right now is, and please hear this, right where you are is OK. Can you hear me? Can you understand that? Can you accept it? Because if you can't accept the fact that where you are is OK, how do you grow up with God? Hmm. Grow up with God. So when I got up and I was busy putting all of this stuff into the computer, one of my ways of growing up with God is a word called surrender. Anybody here know that word? <laughs> Anybody here like that word? Anybody here don't like that word? Because if you don't like that word, it will be hanging around till you get used to it. Surrender. And there's times when I don't want to surrender. And one of the things that happened in my surrendering was when I got up to download what I had experienced, there was a title from Spirit in there. It said, you're going to write a book. And I went, no! <laughs> like I have every other time it's come up, and it's been coming up since I was in my 30s, OK? A while. People would say things to me like, oh, Bonnie Ellen Rice is a great author's name. So you say. <laughs> is God listening? <laughs> <laughs> from your mouth to God's ear. But there's always been pushback. I have always said, no, no, I am not writing. I'll get up and talk. I'll, go, I'll draw. I'll do pottery. I'll do stained glass. I'll do all the things I've been doing since I was a child. Don't ask me to write. And I have written things, but not a book. So I'm writing, and I hear this, you're going to write. And there was no pushback. There was no, no, I'm not going to do that. I'll never do that. There was no pushback. And I thought, whoa, we've been growing up with God. Another step. And so, this is one of the laws that I will talk to you about. And so I said, okay, there's no pushback. Okay, I'll write a book. And the whole thing vanished. It just vanished. It just disappeared. Have you ever surrendered and found that the thing you surrendered to never had to happen? I'm serious. You can jokingly say, no, I'm not going to do it. And as long as you're going... No, the universe is going to push back. That's a basic metaphysical law. It's talked about in almost every religion. When you go to surrender, if you push back, you're not surrendering. And sometimes if you go to surrender, and I will give you a case in point, you don't have to. It doesn't happen. It doesn't take place. And when I didn't push back, that was not the thought I was having. I was just surprised to see I wasn't pushing back. A number of years ago, a friend of mine and her husband divorced, and he asked me if I would come while I was in the school of ministry and during the daytime live in their home in Malibu and go to school at night and take care of their daughter for them. While Because he had the daughter. And I remember my first reaction to it was, no. <laughs> no. And then nothing more was said about it for a while, and so I kept taking it back into meditation. And finally I said, okay. 
And the minute I said okay, the whole perception changed. They decided to do other things, to do this, to do that. They were still separated but in getting a divorce, but this whole thing was going to be handled in a completely different way, and I never had to do it. That's the case in point. Now, I don't advise you to deliberately say no, hoping it'll go away. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It never has. You get to say no when you really, really mean it. So Bonnie calls me a few months ago and says, I know you're not speaking, but would you, I'm doing stuff on immortality that month. Will you come and speak because of your experiences? And I said, yes. And then I went. <laughs> but I surrender. A number of years ago, I was telling Tina, a number of years ago, I drew a picture when I was living in the Buddhist Meditation Center. I drew a picture of an angel. And I threw it in my, when I would do this kind of thing, I'd throw it in my art file. And I threw it in my art file. And periodically, I'll take it out and look at it and go, you know, I really should do that. And then about a year ago, the thought came to me that I should do a piece of pottery that looks like the angel. How does the angel look that I drew? She's standing like this with her head back, and she's surrendering. How many years ago? Well, I've been here in New Mexico 20 years, a little over. So maybe 30 years ago? So I decided the other day that I needed to go get some stuff at Hobby Lobby, and, and I, was, I walked through the door, and... I heard my inner voice say, there's an angel here for you. Okay. Well, because guess what? They have all their Christmas stuff out. Okay? What is it? It's not even Halloween yet. All their Christmas stuff is out. So I thought, okay. So I went and got what I went to get, and then I started looking. And I'm looking through all of the Christmas stuff, and I saw two angels. Two. I mean, usually they're falling off the... Shelves, you know, they're all over the place. Two angels. And I went, no, there's an angel here for me. And I kept looking, and I kept walking up and down the aisles and looking and looking. And finally I looked way up on one of their top shelves, and I looked at their Christmas decorations up there, and isn't that an angel up there? Oh, so being the shrimp... I called over the tallest guy I could find, and I said, would you take that angel down so I can take a look at it? And then while he was doing that, I saw another angel. Well, they were made, they look like they were glass, but they're plastic. He hands me the angel, and guess what the angel is doing? <laughs> Surrendering. Is this a fantasy? Is this a tale? No, this is my life. When I come to speak to you, what do I bring? Not only my experience, but my experiences in my lives. How many of you have been somewhere that you know what's coming around the next corner, but you've never actually been there? How many of you have met people you know you know them? How many of you have had those experiences that lead you to understand and believe that there's more to this life than getting out of bed every morning, going to work, or whatever it is you do, that there's more to this life than you can see, maybe that you can feel Places where you go that you feel comfortable, places that you go you don't feel comfortable. Things that you cry about, you don't know why you're crying. It's all there. You are living the experience. And why did you come to do that? Why did you come to live this experience? Does anybody know? 
No? Nobody knows? Hmm. You're going to what? Evolve. Yeah. Okay. You're going to evolve. What else? Come on, you guys. You've been around this a long time. Come on. Don't be shy. Remember, nothing's wrong. I'm not making you wrong. To give God a human experience. Thank you. And what does your soul say about that? Because you have a soul that has lived all your experiences. My soul says it's okay with that. Good. So, if you're not in form, you're not in a human form, you are formless. And we are all seeking form as experience. Your form takes up space which means it takes up time, time to get from here to here to here, and it is your experience. It's the living experience of your soul. Does that make any sense to you? If you are going to be in a body and you're going to have experiences, and then, of course, what does that leave you with? The thing that everybody says no to. I'm going to take responsibility. Oops. I'm responsible. Yes, you are responsible. You are responsible. And that is part of growing up with God. A couple of years ago, I spent one year down with God. Communicated very little with anyone. And everybody knew. They could call and leave a message or text me, but... I was not receiving company. Periodically, I would go out and be around people. But it was me, God, and law. Law. Oh, yes. We talk a lot about love. We talk about the Old Testament, which is law, the New Testament, which is love. And then we bring it together as an experience in which the most important part of is keeping it in balance, keeping yourself in balance is one of the most important parts. It comes right after surrender. <laughs> so when you're thinking about yourself and you're growing up, are you thinking about yourself and growing up with God, with spirit, with Yahweh, with Jehovah, with Muhammad, with Buddha? Who do you think of yourself as growing up with? That which I finally would say to people, especially if they were atheists, that which is greater than you are. That which is greater than you are. Are you growing? And it's not that I'm telling you that you have to grow. You don't have to do anything. You don't even have to be here. You are listening to something that I'm sharing with you that I think is important in my growth, and I'm sharing it with you because I'm hoping that you are growing as well as I have grown or you are growing in your own space and you're growing in your own time and all of the experiences that come into you help you grow all of them good, bad, or indifferent they all help you grow that's the bottom line and the immortality of it is that, as Shakespeare so lovingly put it, all the world is a stage and all the men and women merely players. You can do it as many times as you want. You can not do it as many times as you want. You can be no form. You can be form. But one of the reasons, on top of being form, that it's important that you're here that you take up time and space and you process. You take time for your brain to process. You take time for your body to process. Body processes and healing. Mind grows, accepts, rejects, pushes away, 
does whatever it's going to do, and I'm here to tell you it's okay. I set no limitations for my child. Expectations, but no limitations. There's a difference. I can expect you to do certain things, but you're only going to do what you need to do for yourself. Is that not right? It's an inside job. We say it over and over and over again, and it's finally coming out in various and sundry ways from very many different religions and beliefs, and atheists as well. They see it in commercials. They see it growing into a greater consciousness, greater, not smaller, not higher, not lower, greater. It's an expansion for everybody because as you expand your world, other people are expanding theirs as well. And some people choose not to expand, like my year down with God. I didn't expand that year, except in here. And God and I were talking about law, and it wasn't a pretty conversation. But there's times when my conversations with God are not pretty. And there's times when they are wonderful and ecstatic. I try not to live in fantasy with where I am. But at the same time, I recognize that where I am is different from where you are. You want to hear what I have to say about my life, my growth, and what I believe, then I come and talk to you about that. So, does anybody in here, we have a couple of minutes, have questions? No questions? Really? Oh, come on. You have to have some questions. You're smiling. <laughs> Teresa's smiling. Yes. So what are some of the things that people talk about when they are about to transition? Do you really want to know? Yeah. They're not confessing to me. They start talking about things that if they talked about in normal life, people would think they were crazy. I've heard more woo-woo stories than you could possibly shake a stick at. Because suddenly they can tell those woo-woo stories they've been having all of their lifetime. And I won't think they're crazy. Or if I think they're crazy, it doesn't make any difference because they're transcending. Does that... I mean... There are certain ways that we think. I mean, I had one woman at UCLA tell me she knew when she was dying. She was a metaphysician. She knew when she was dying. I don't happen to want to know when I'm dying. I can guess at it, but I don't want to know. I'm just going to go till I'm not going anymore. It's, it's real simple. Am I, am I worried about when I die, what's going to happen to me? Yes, that's the biggest question. What's going to happen to me? Because they didn't like what they heard about dying, so they want now to hear something better. Can I give them anything better? No, all I can do is take them back into their hearts. I cannot make you feel better. I can sit next to you and hold your hand. I can give you a hug when you need one. Words of wisdom that they've been hearing all their life and never answered that question? I couldn't possibly. One of the things that we have to understand as human beings is we don't know the answers. We think we do. I have answers for me, but they may not be your answers. And when I'm going into a room and I don't know that human being, guess what? I don't have their answers. And I keep guiding them back to themselves. What do you believe? So when they're dying, they tell me. First, they start off with little stories. I think one of the saddest things that I experienced, and this was really early on in my 35 years, I kept running into women who'd been molested by their families, who were in their 80s and 90s and never told anybody. And 
we would talk about it. It's the first time in their entire life that they'd ever talked about it. It held it, carried it all those years and never talked about it because you just didn't. And besides which, it's totally disloyal to the family. Ah. So yeah, that's one of the things that people would talk about. Um, when I was working the psych unit at UCLA, I was the problem. The religion was the problem. When I worked the psych unit at Long Beach Community um, Hospital, I was one of the answers. I was one of the solutions. And I had a guy who used to come up to me and call me Mother Mary. That was, that's who I was to him, Mother Mary. So things are said. But it is a time when people begin to think that they can start talking about the things they've never talked about, and that's why they need the chaplains there. That's why, and the chaplains need to be supporting chaplains who support them in that understanding of what they went through. Maybe they want to know about what they went through before they die. What is, and all you can do is lead them back to themselves. What did you get out of it? What did it mean to you? When you were sitting there telling me this woo-woo story about seeing spirits and candles lighting automatically, what were you telling me? That you were having a mystical experience. That nobody had ever made okay with you because you never made it okay with yourself. What is it you haven't made okay with yourself? One of my questions when I'm working with people who are in transition. And let's see if that can be changed. Let's see if somewhere along the line I can look at you and say, what did you learn when you were living the experience. These are questions you can already start asking yourself. What did you learn while you have been living this experience? Because that's an important part of the journey of your soul. Did you do this and you didn't like that? Do something else. You know, I don't think that today young people are so much enamored of getting a job, staying in it for 50 years. I think that we have grown as human beings. Certainly, if you look at the world around you, you see that that has happened, that people have grown. But it doesn't stop because you're 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. If you make it to 100 or more, it doesn't stop, and people who have been there will tell you, this hasn't stopped. I'm still learning. Is that something that you can accept? Can you accept that, that you're still learning? Gosh, I hope so. Any other questions? Okay. I want you to remember this is your life. You are living this experience. It's all yours. And God bless.